The Photo Vault. A journey into vernacular photography, archives and photo books. Hi and welcome to this second episode of The Photo Vault. When I started to think about this podcast, I made a list in my head of who would be the ideal candidates to talk to in order to start the podcast right. Anyone who's interested in critical writing and thinking on photography, the history of photography and certainly vernacular will have come across Jeffrey Batchen's name, as he has written for more than 20 years on vernacular photography. And lucky me, Jeffrey and I were invited to speak at the same conference in Budapest last week, so I had the chance to record a conversation for you. The conference was organized by the Eidolon Center in Budapest with experts in the field of vernacular photography. We will create a special edition on this conference as it gave fantastic insights into the subject from a range of voices and angles. In case you're not too familiar with Jeffrey's work, he's a specialist in the history of photography and currently professor at Oxford. He also curates exhibitions, has done editorial work and of course is a prolific writer on photography as a historian. Jeffrey is also one of the people responsible for us using the term vernacular photography in the way we do today, thanks to his essay Vernacular Photographies published in the year 2000 and other writings he's done. There are a few references he gives in this conversation and you can access links to those in the text section of the podcast. I also created a small summary of what Jeffrey said at the end of the podcast at about minute 40. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You had a talk yesterday and I picked up on a few points from that presentation. Um, and I, I think the first one I would talk about or would like to get deeper into is the idea that there is no banal image. You said that and you showed us also a couple of daguerreotypes that had nothing on it. So it raised that question that it's not really what we see, but how we see it. Yeah. Um, of course, most ordinary photographs are repetitious. You know, they're conventional, they're very, usually very socially conformist. So in that sense, they can be reasonably described as banal in that they're predictable and unoriginal. But this is, of course, the nature of vernacular photography, this repetition of certain kinds of tropes and conventions, poses, gestures, and so on. And as an historian, I don't want to repress what is uh, particular to them. So I think whatever the nature of them, we have to engage with them as they are and not, you know, not for example, as many people do, and maybe that's something we'll come to discuss today. Um, just pick out the exceptional ones, the innovative ones, the ones that have pictorial interest for some reason. As an historian, I have to deal with them as they really are. So uh, on the one hand, of course, I happily concede that, that ordinary photographs are often repetitious and pictorially not very interesting. But on the other hand, I've often said there's really no such thing as a banal photograph. There's only banal ways of talking about photographs. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are a creative writer or curator or publisher, um, there are ways to work with those photographs to reveal actually often some quite profound depths to them, despite the at first glance apparently repetitious nature of their, you know, their pictorial conventions. Um, they nevertheless express often quite deep human commitments and deep human yearnings, you might say. And that's the kind of thing I try to look for when I, when I write about them myself. Well, but even from a scientific approach, isn't it more comforting in a way that we have a lot of the same, which verifies that it is what it is? Well, I think that's one of the things, again, that one needs to discuss is that the rep if the gesture is endlessly repeated, then obviously people find it significant. And, and the first thing you would want to do is work out, well, why is that gesture considered significant? Um, now, like all of us, if someone brings out a camera, we smile, we stand upright, we, we almost automatically adopt certain uh, bodily gestures in front of a camera and we don't think about it. We do it sort of on autopilot. Um, but if we did step back and think about it, we might realize there is a history to those gestures. We have learned them, you might say, as part of the learning of our culture in general. And again, as an historian, kind of my job is to try and step back and say, well, why do we smile in front of a camera? Why do we, why do, why as a photographer, why do we center everybody in the middle of the picture plane? There are actually reasons and there are histories and you can do some research and find out that in fact, the smile has not always been, it was something introduced by Kodak around the turn of the 20th century. People were encouraged to smile. Whereas in the 19th century, that was considered a working class gesture, uncouth, vulgar. 
And so you avoided smiling in front of the camera. So there's a history to almost everything. Nothing is entirely natural. And are these one of the interesting things to tease out? And you know, as I was saying, the repetition of gestures is a kind of sign or a signal that there's something interesting going on here that we need to think about. Now, for you as a historian, where you work also with a lot of colleagues uh, who maybe don't share necessarily your views, where, where is the space for vernacular photography in that sort of set history that we almost have, or people pretend to think we have, that set history? Where do we squeeze the vernacular in? Well, okay, this is a big question. Yeah. Um, the problem that we face is that the history of photography throughout the 20th century has been shaped by the discourse of art history. It's been dominated by art museums through exhibitions and catalogues and indeed through curatorial writings. And art history has certain kind of principal um, conventions of its own. Uh, for example, um, authorship, it likes to, bio to have a biography for the artist. It likes innovation, it likes rarity. Art museums are very dependent on the gifts of collectors and collectors too, like rarity and value and things like this. So vernaculars have had a difficulty finding a place within that, within that kind of um, set of conventions because vernaculars tend to come to us maker unknown. They tend to be, as we've already said, repetitious in pictorial values. They tend to be cheap or indeed valueless. Um, and therefore, why would collectors collect them? Why would art museums value them? So uh, in general, vernaculars have struggled to find a place within the, disc the official discourse of photography. And of course, um, Beaumont Newhall's books, for example, they do mention snapshots and spend half a page on them. Mm -hmm. When you think how many snapshots are made in a given day, that page is inadequate to the sheer volume and possibly the sheer significance of, say, the personal snapshot yeah. within the history of photography. But it's hard for Beaumont to find how to, things to say about them because they're not very interesting as pictures as, as he sees it. The way in which um, art discourses have tried to deal with that is by finding exceptional snapshots, by finding snapshots that look as if they might have been made by Rodchenko or Maholinaj, um, by finding snapshots that are uh, torn or that people have played out in front of the camera or they may be covered in mold and they make them look a bit abstract and things like that. So in effect, they've done the same job. They've looked for exceptional snapshots. So they've looked for exceptional vernacular photographs. Uh, and th in that way, some vernaculars have made their way into the official discourse uh, found in art museums or occasionally in the history of photography books. But obviously my whole career has been about trying to shift the shape of the history of photography and find a way in which that discourse can actually engage with all of photography and not just personal snapshots where most of the emphasis in the, in the symposium that we were both at yesterday uh, rested. But, you know, architectural photographs, medical photographs, astronomical photographs, advertising photographs, fashion photographs, there is just a huge world of photography that even now has barely been touched on by scholars and or by museums. If we are to engage with a medium that is surely the most important of the last 150 years that has mediated our culture in myriad, myriad numbers of ways, we need to learn how to embrace it all, the good and the bad, if you like, the boring and the unboring. And that's what my own work has tried to do. Um, um, maybe we can talk about how one might go about doing that, but, but that's what my own work has tried to do. And as I say, the first thing I think is to um, invent ways to actually make these things interesting, even in their repetition and in their banality. Since you, I mean, the first uh, work I read of yours, and I would say many people who are interested in vernacular is your 2000 essay on vernacular photography. I mean, things have changed. Um, was it you who suggested the uh, term vernacular photography? I mean, I may well have popularized it, but I was writing, uh, the essay you, you mentioned came out in 2000, and I, but I was writing in a little moment in which suddenly an awful lot of people, including dealers, mm -hmm. were suddenly selling snapshots in little frames and uh, for money, like $150 a piece. It was yeah. kind of shocking to go and see it. So uh, in a way, my essay was a response to something that was already happening, ma mainly in the marketplace. And, you know, museums ha have, in fact, since the 1940s, but certainly at the end of the 20th century, quite a few museums, uh, interestingly, at the moment when digital 
technology was being introduced. And for example, the analog snapshot was in fact already had become a, a kind mm. of obsolete technology. Suddenly museums collect them, suddenly museums show them as if uh, to share our own nostalgia with, back with us. So yeah, in 2000, um, I wrote this, you might say, academic style of essay about this phenomenon. And I did choose that term over other terms that were at that time being kicked around. And I, st I would still say it's not a bad term. And I tried to explain even in my essay, um, not only does it mean the ordinary, if you like, the banal, the industrial, the commercial, the personal, but it also, if you look it up in the dictionary, it, it speaks about speaking the vernacular. That is, it also means the local, the regional, the, the sort of culturally specific. And one of the things I did emphasize um, in that essay was that if one was to engage with vernacular photography, one isn't just engaging with the personal snapshot or with, uh, you know, the commercial part, the visite or the tin type, uh, you, but you're also having to engage with culturally specific practices in Mexico or Venezuela or Thailand or wherever you might look for them. Um, and that that's what the history of photography needed to do was to encompass not only its own its own rejected banal things, but also it recognized the cultural differences within photography, that there are actually many photographies that um, a photograph found in Korea may not, even though it may look familiar to us, it's a photographic portrait, may mean different things there than it does, than our portraits do in the United States or in Britain. So that has been my, that was my push back in 2000 and it seemed to have some purchase, a lot of mm -hmm. people um, a lot more people started to look at this kind of material. As I say, I'm, I was just a voice of a moment in which already a number of people were looking at this kind of material. And it's got to the point now, 23 years later, where the term seems to have just become almost ubiquitous, a commonplace. We wouldn't be surprised now to go into an art museum and see some snapshots on display. However, as I've already said, probably snapshots that aren't necessarily representative of personal snapshots, if that if such a thing is possible. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's now become a commonplace term. And a lot of interesting scholarship has been done and a lot of, I mean, even your own publishing um, industry uh, has revealed an awful lot of interesting things out there that we were previously unfamiliar with or had probably, probably would not have stopped to see or notice or think it was interesting. Um, so that's all been for the good. The, the, the field of photography studies has definitely expanded. Um, I'd say, and I do say, there are still a few issues to be engaged. I would say we still haven't embraced um, the degree of the differences within photography and especially regional and cultural practices. Um, the West tends to be somewhat self-centric and has not yet um, embraced or, or come to terms with those differences. But a lot of interesting work has been done for sure. Yeah, I can see. I mean, even with my own work as I work primarily in the, in the global south, there's locally a lot more small projects you hear all of a sudden from Zambia or from, from Malaysia, people also who get in touch with me and we're working on things. Yeah. So definitely that, that, that wave of interest in the local vernacular is, is, is on the rise. It is. However, <clears throat> we, again, there's a history to it. So I mean, why would somebody from Zambia, say, approach you? Well, OK, they've been looking at um, Bamako and they can see that Malik Sidibe and Sadar Keita are now world stars and that what once upon a time were vernacular portraits made, you know, for a, a Malian clientele are now being shown in the Metropolitan Museum and that there's a lot of money in it. So suddenly from India to South America to Africa, we find lots of vernacular, so-called vernacular for practitioners becoming more visible. And I'm sure dealers and collectors and museums are out there hunting for the next Kaita, the next Sidibe. So, um, yeah, as a historian, there's a history again, and one, one needs to step back. Uh, it's the how one is going to deal with these works. How, to what degree can we maintain their regional specificity? Uh, to what degree does Kaita appear to be like Richard Avedon prints, you know, the, the size of a wall, when his original work as a commercial photographer was the size of a postcard or, you know, half your hand. And now we find them and he finds them and he found them and he was amazed to see them printed in Europe at huge scale as artworks. So there's a transformation that occurs there and whatever qualities pertain to, say, Kaita's practice as a portraitist in Bamako are 
lost. I mean, there are vestiges of them lingering in the, even in the giant size print. But what might have been regionally specific about it is, is completely removed and he just becomes the equivalent of a Western art photographer. So this is the way the market and um, including art museums in that word uh, operate. And again, as an historian, one has to try and step out of that. I mean, we are, as historians, we are not collectors. We're not art museum professionals. We're supposed to take a longer view and step back and have some perspective. And I see, you know, that is the role of people like myself who, who are academics and therefore are not dependent on the market and not caught up in the conventions of art museums. <clears throat> Um, so I, as much as possible, I constantly be trying to remind people of what Kaida and Sudebe actually were doing in Barmaka as opposed to how they appear to us now in the West. Yeah. And I would say it's probably similar, and I'm sure you would grapple with this problem every time you encounter a, a group or a practice in another place, um, especially like me, a Westerner, looking at these things from, in effect, outside the culture. Okay, what's the appropriate way to engage with this practice, to present it, uh, to what degree can we channel local sentiments and local oral histories about this practice? Um, how can we retain its regional specificity while also presenting it to the rest of the world as something interesting? Yeah. Um, you know, what is the danger of aestheticizing it in a particular way? Even the repetition that we talked about at the outset, which of course appeals to us as taxonomic creatures who, who love the work of the Beshers, and it's constant repetition of the, of the near same. So we're very used to that as an aesthetic and it's very easy to impose that aesthetic on similar vernacular practices. Kaida's portraits all look much the same and therefore uh, they very much suit our aesthetic, you know, our aesthetic sensibilities. So I think there are complex, you might call ethical issues to be dealt with, yeah. um, as well as historical issues about exactly determining what was the meaning of these practices for these people at the time they were made versus say where we often encounter them in junk stores or in pers people's personal archives, possibly several decades after this practice was first you know, significant and, and indeed often we only come across them precisely because they're no longer of the same significance to those people. So how do we restore something of their original, original meaning to them? I mean, these are all complex issues and you just have to grapple with them on a case-by-case -case basis, I think. So someone like you is here to keep the balance. Well, one does one's best, yeah. but, but, you know, I, I, I know because I heard your paper too that you, you have the same issues that I have. You know, I'm a European or actually Australian, but European-based scholar looking, say, at West Africa and trying to make sense of it. Of course, most of what I say is secondhand. I'm speaking as an outsider of a culture, you try and do your best to determine um, what the significance of those objects might be to that culture. Wherever possible, you try and channel the words of people from the culture itself. But in the end, you have to recognize that you inevitably have some biases of your own and uh, huge amounts of ignorance to overcome. Absolutely. However, uh, perhaps your first, um, your first responsibility is to at least make visible and acknowledge the existence of these practices. And if you can, to underline there's a difference here and it may, may be a difference that can't entirely be bridged. Maybe we're not never gonna really understand why that woman is lying that the, in the way she does in that Kaida portrait. I mean, we can hear that she's, she's pretending to wait for a, um, a, you know, a lover or, a, or a, somebody who's courting her favor and you know, this is the gesture that women did in the home and they've replicated it in Kaida's studio. So, you faithfully repeat this information as best you can. And in that case, my role is to remind people that when they see that print at the Museum of Modern Art and it's six foot wide, this isn't how a Bamako person would have seen it. There's a history to how we get to see them. And indeed, let's say your own projects, if I was to write a history of those projects, your role would be part of that history. In other words, I think it's important that we don't erase the the relationship that outsiders have had in even bringing that material forward um, it doesn't just come to us you know sort of naturally there's an intervention of various yeah. kinds and you know how, how do westerners get to be in myanmar or or zambia yeah, or whatever it is at any certain point in history and what their role has been and what colonial baggage comes with that intervention you know without the privileges that we have myanmar people don't come to get don't get to come to 
London and right. scour right. antique right. stores. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, tell us yeah. how peculiar we all are. So we need to be yeah. properly uh, modest about it, uh, humble about it, I think. I mean, for me, with my small publishing projects and the research and the archives I do, uh, trying to give a local access to the information is sort of, sort of key, as I also mentioned yesterday in the talk. How is it in the academic world? I mean, is, is there a movement towards, towards that, trying to actually have academic material, papers, information, resources more available locally in smaller places? Are there networks? Like, how does that work? I have always been fortunate that I speak the imperial language of our moment. It may change to Chinese fairly soon, but at the moment it tends to be English. And therefore, when I write, I can, I mean, this is the privilege, reasonably presume that anybody who's interested in West Africa will probably have to have learned English and therefore will have access to what I do. But the short answer is, uh, I know, from, again, from hearing your talk yesterday, you go to a lot of trouble to make sure your books get into the hands of the people from the culture where these photographs have come from. I don't make that effort. I have, I have to confess that right up front. Most of my writing, though, um, is addressed to my people, if you like. It's like trying to persuade, well, I guess people like yourself, but the whole sort of field of scholarship in which I'm engaged, that this, this kind of work is important and these kinds of uh, analytical processes are necessary and these kinds of ethical uh, dilemmas need to be addressed and, and engaged with. So I'm not, of course, uh, imagining that anybody in Zambia should or would ever read my work, or Bamako for that matter. My, my essays are to those people who might look at these things at MoMA and go away with a certain, what they think is an understanding, and I try and provide, a, you might say, a corrective or at least a more nuanced view. Uh, so my writing is almost inevitably addressed to the West rather than to elsewhere. Yesterday, I was sort of, um, I was really interested in that, that hint of criticism I heard in your voice also towards maybe also the world that I'm part in because I make objects that are within the, the art world. I mean, we, we, we beautify also the history in order to make it accessible. I mean, yeah. that's what publishers, uh, photo book publishers like myself do, uh, people also who create exhibitions. I mean, what we do is we create of sorts an, an entertainment value towards history in order to engage people. Yes. Now, we are at that extent where the vernacular is extremely interesting to collectors. We have large scale collections. We have scale exhibitions. We have money involved in this. Yeah. Um, but that poses problems. Oh, I mean, money, the root of all evil, right? <laughs> if only we all had some more of it. But um, this is what I would say. What I often try and remind my audiences is that everybody has a role. There are collectors, there are museums, there are museum curators, um, there are critics, if you like, there are makers, and there are historians and academics. And uh, as I was saying before, if you're an academic and you, in effect, have a you know, guaranteed salary and a space in which research is actually encouraged, this is a great privilege and it allows you to have a certain kind of perspective and to be free of certain kinds of pressures that somebody like yourself mm. who has to sell these books and distribute these books and get audiences for these books, you have a different set of demands. So I think we each have our role. I mean, I heard you speak yesterday about these fashion photographs in Myanmar. I'm already fascinated, incredible find, congratulations. Uh, and, you know, I will want to investigate that further. And perhaps in the course of my investigation, I'll say, well, Lucas has repeated them, in, he's printed them in a certain way, they've shifted scale, they've, but this is inevitable. I, there's no way in which you can actually present them as a person yeah. from Myanmar might do. I, I know you do your best to channel some sense of what they might have meant to those people, but inevitably some sort of transformation occurs. So there's no purity here, and, and I'm not an advocate of purity. I'm an advocate for honesty, if you like. And so my role will be to say, well, these things have come to us via Lucas and his publishing thing, and, and maybe I could address some of the constraints within which you work, he, he needs to find an audience, it needs to be in book form, whereas they were never meant to be in a book, you know. So my role is to hold you to account, but also to provide a history to what you do and, and why you, it comes out the way it does. And, it, you know, equally you have to do what, what you do and um, responding to the constraints within which you have to work, including economic ones, which, you know, I fortunately am relatively free of because of this, the nature of my position. So I think we all have our roles. 
Um, uh, museums, on the other hand, are popularizers. So by the time a Kaida photograph finds its way into an art museum, it, it reaches an audience that would never read anything by Jeffrey Batchen. So they too have their role. Um, and hopefully there's a lot of checks and balances in those different roles. But, mm. but perhaps the most um, difficult, or you might say ethically challenged role is that of the collector. And the degree to which collectors have been shaping the discourse in recent years, both because often these collectors are very wealthy and so they have huge resources, and because they have their own um, desires invested in their collecting, which is often um, almost obsessional in its mm-hmm. acuity of focus. Um, yeah, we collect, I, I would say, a history of the role of the collector needs to be written. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. And, we, and, you know, we've been in a symposium here in Budapest the last 24 hours and we've heard from some of those collectors. And I'd say obsession is one thing that binds them. Yeah. And, but we're, I'm sure you were aware they have certain interests at play that really does mediate the way we get to see their collections. In both cases, they select from the millions of personal snapshots that might be shown. They select the quirky ones, the ones that interest them. They discard most of what they actually yeah. see or find. So their role is actually their role as, as as mediators is actually crucial. And yet, I think most people looking at their websites would imagine they're just seeing what is, not a very partial selection of what is. So again, my role as an historian might be to provide a history to that process, yeah. how these snapshots have been favoured over the million that have been discarded, and why that might be. What has appealed to this collector about these ones and not the banal and repetitious ones that we began this conversation yeah. about? Yeah. Well, it's also in these collections, probably you and I would look into the discarded pile. If, if we could, but I suspect when they discard, they really discard. And inevitably, because I mean, again, we were part of this conversation yesterday, it's these collections that will eventually find their way into an institutional archive, whether it's the local museum or the National Library or some other such place. And in a hundred years time, people will think, oh, this is what Hungarian snapshots were like. Yeah. When in fact, we know just from listening to these collectors, this isn't actually what Hungarian snapshots are actually like. This is what a very small and partial selection of these snapshots look like. Yeah. So again, I have a privileged position of not being caught up in the collection in the collectors, but even academics are constantly negotiating the ethics of this because Collectors often call on us to justify their collections or to talk yeah. about their collections. And it's difficult. You, you're walking these fine lines where you are grateful and indeed beholden to the collector they're paying you. On the other hand, you want to say certain things about what effect collecting has had on what we're seeing. So you have to, it's a fine balance and yeah. finding the right tone is often a tricky, a tricky thing. Mm-hmm. Do you collect yourself? Like you go out and look for things? Unfortunately, I am a big collector um, and it is somewhat obsessional. So I can certainly see my problem in their problem. Um, Yeah, I I, I buy a lot of things on eBay and have for many years. Um, I uh, I don't have the resources to collect the way the collectors that we've just been watching do. And I, it's not like a full-time profession in a way, the yeah. way you are. <laughs> um, and I often collect for the purposes of research, or that's how I justify my collecting. And I've done exhibitions, uh, some of which you know, are familiar to readers, like Forget Me Not, which yeah. was about photography and memory. Now, a lot of that exhibition was from my own collection, and, and there was a reason, because I wanted to include, for example, um, pieces of photographic jewellery. With, that is jewellery with photographs in it or photographs and hair and things like this. Museums don't collect that or didn't collect that kind of material. I couldn't find any to borrow. So you go down to your local antique store and there's stacks of it, yeah. but cheap. You know, it's not very highly valued. So I would buy some so that there could be some in the exhibition. And I've often proceeded that way. I almost always collect with a view to eventually exhibiting what I'm collecting. Um, or... or to teach with the material. I mean, I can only afford really representative daguerreotypes, and so I have quite a few, and I often use them in teaching so that students have something they can actually touch and handle and get a feel for. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm a collector, so I can certainly recognize the obsessional quality um, that other people have. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a um, 
single genre centric collector the way many people are. Yeah, I have drawers of snapshots, but I also have drawers of daguerreotypes and other things. Yeah. You mentioned yesterday that in a way the, the future, because it's sort of the, the, the idea of the future of vernacular photography is in a way to just have it as being photography. So that's sort of yes. remove that vernacular because every photograph is a photograph. Yes. But here my question is, isn't, isn't a photograph also the intention that is behind it? Because there's a big intention, as you said, whether these were taken in Africa for some postcard size images or they were conceived as being art prints and made for an enormous audience in a big size. Yes. So isn't the intention really important? So photograph actually is not photograph. So the question would be, um, is there a, a, an intention specific to the vernacular photograph that mm. is separate from the intention uh, that motivates, say, an art photograph? And I would wonder about that. <laughs> I mean, a lot of vernacular photography is commercial photography and, for example, architectural photography yeah. or fashion photography or indeed commercial portraiture um, over the last 200 years. Of course, is driven by the market and by profits. And so are art photographers uh, motivated in large part by the market. But the problem I have now after 23 years with the word vernacular photography is it presumes that there's a kind of ghetto in which we should put ordinary photographs and all the photographs I've just mentioned. And then there's another space in which art photography exists. My own view is that you should, we should be asking the same questions of all kinds of photography. So if I see a Man Ray photograph, I should be asking the same kind of questions of it including about its intention, uh, its presumed audience, its presumed market, that I might ask of a 19th century tintype portrait or a medical photograph, that we should be asking as an historian, what is its function? What is its motivation? I prefer motivation to intention because I don't think photograph makers always even know their own intentions, if you know what I mean. But I think as an historian, we can determine to some degree what the motivation might have been, conscious or unconscious. So we would be asking about the same questions of a humble personal snapshot that we ask of a man Ray. And in both cases, the question is, you know, what does it do? What did it do and what does it do and why does it do it and how does it do it? These are the questions historians should be asking of photographs. Why are we wasting time and saying, well, does it fit into the vernacular ghetto or into the art ghetto? There's also the presumption that if we separate vernacular photography from art photography, there's still this lingering association of the vernacular with the banal and that somehow art photography is not banal. Oh my God, if you go to art galleries and look at art, 99% of it is banal. It's it's totally <laughs> if, you, if you're familiar with the art world, you have seen this, this trope before. That most of it is in fact not very original. Most of it is made for the market. Most of it is pitching for a middle brow audience. It's very similar in fact to vernacular mm -hmm. photography. And Uh, the idea that art photography is somehow a special category is something we need to get away from. It's a market. It, it, people, artists make work to sell their luxury goods that they sell to middle and upper middle class buyers. Not that different from wedding photographers or any other kind of photography. So um, I am an advocate now that we abandon the word vernacular and we regard all photography as what it is, photography. And then we ask the questions that might specify that photography, mm -hmm. how, the, how a Man Ray is different, say, from, than a portrait by uh, Seydal Keita taken in Bamako in 1940. Um, and those differences are, of course, interesting and instructive. The problem I have, if, if we just call everything that is not art vernacular, it kind of homogenizes it. It actually erases the differences within that category. And I think as historians and indeed as publishers, we should be constantly looking to highlight you know, how variegated the world is, how photography is not a homogenous thing, how a portrait that was made in Myanmar doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as one that was made in Vienna. So this should be our task. I'm not sure that the word vernacular photography or the phrase vernacular photography anymore helps that task. I think it's just all photography. And I think that's the way we should treat it. I mean, how far in terms of history are you are you interested are you also working on contemporary issues um if you're a photo historian um you by necessity are a jack of all trades so although i have um indeed written a few things about vernacular photography i'm probably best known for writing about very early photography and the invention of photography but i have frequently written about indeed contemporary art photography and contemporary photography um 
something about my talk yesterday that you were you were nice enough to, to witness. Uh, part of what drives me, I mean, in other words, even me as a scholar, we have our economic constraints. I have to find photographs that I can afford to reproduce. So I tend to show older examples because they're outside of copyright. If I was to show uh, work from the 1980s and 1990s, I would have to seek copyright clearance and pay a, co a, a cost. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to show material from, you know, before 1970 because it tends to be out of copyright. So it's as simple as that, really. Um, in other words, I'd be perfectly happy to include examples of, let's call it digital vernacular photography, but it deliberately didn't in the symposium yesterday because we have a world-renowned artist, Joachim Schmidt, and that's precisely what his work does. He looks at websites and uses digital snapshots as the, as the sort of raw material for his art making. And I knew that he was going to make a whole presentation on that, so I didn't bother to. Yeah. Um, again, it, it often has been our artists, despite everything I've said, it's often been our artists who have produced the most intelligent reflections on contemporary vernacular photography, uh, Joachim Schmidt, Joan von Kaberda, Eric Kessels, uh, Penelope Umbrico in the United States, and there are many others, Patrick Pound mm -hmm. in Australia. It, it, there is a kind of worldwide phenomenon of artists using found photographs, whether digital or analog, and then re, you know, adding a creative element to them that you know, I greatly admire, and, and they have often done the critical work that historians should have done. So for our listeners who are really into vernacular and want to get further, what would you recommend them to, to read? Oh, everything I've ever written, I guess. <laughs> the, the most important thing is to have an acute eye and to be honest about what you see and how you found it and your own circumstances, your own role in the finding and things like that. This is what I would recommend. Um, one needs to look and notice the world. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I first got into the, the vernacular photography field was I would have been in those same antique stores many times and not noticed that photographic yeah. jewelry or not noticed that painted tin type. But when I started to think about, you know, all of the questions we've been canvassing today, uh, my eye was somewhat more educated and I would go into the same store and I'd ne recognize and notice things that had probably always been there, but I'd never thought were of any significance. I was looking for art, possibly. So that's what we all need to do. We need to be... Um, we need to be, I don't know what the right word is, we need our eyes enlivened so that when we see something, either lying in the street or in an archive or in a junk store, we can uh, sufficiently open eye that we can see it as somehow significant. And the thing I would you know, advocate is that, as we started right at the beginning, there is no such thing as a banal photograph. Photography is in fact a philosophically profound medium. It, there's a reason why Walter Benjamin and Roland Barthes have written about them because they're a philosophical import. They're about time and space and subjectivity and sex and death and all of the great human issues. And every photograph is about those things. This is the thing that, that Bart, I think, tried to teach us. There are great paintings like you know, Rembrandt's self-portraits that um, allow us an encounter with, let's say, the process of aging, the imminence of death, the, the nature of human life. But what's amazing about photography is that even the most banal and humble snapshot does the same thing because of the way it engages with time and space. And this is what's remarkable about the medium. Even bad photographs are profound objects. So we need to have that attitude. We need to, as you do, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm very impressed with your own discoveries, so to speak. And I'm sure because when you go to far-flung places, you start looking around and you, yeah. you know, with a kind of open eye, like what's interesting here? And I think that's what people interested in this field need to do, but they also need to, um, as I, we've been stressing throughout our conversation, be informed about the ethical dilemmas that might pertain to the situation, about the histories, including the history of their own role that they need to be aware of and acknowledge in their, in their collecting or in their writing. That's what I would suggest. There's a lot of interesting writing about vernacular photography now. I mean, obviously, I've written about it myself, but there are now many scholars writing about it from a whole variety of different perspectives. Uh, so there's a huge body of literature to read if you on any particular topic if you wanted to pursue it. Great. Well, I think I summarized this conversation with my first sentence, even the way you said, like, there's no banal image. And I think that's still, I still see this as the summary, actually, of this conversation. I think so, yeah. As I say, there's only banal ways of talking about it, so we need to 
not be banal. <laughs> so it's us, it's not it. It's yes, us. exactly, yeah. exactly. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this. It's very nice of you to talk to me. That was Jeffrey Batchen talking to me during a conference on everyday photography organized by the Eidolon Center in Budapest. As announced before we started, I will try to give a summary from my point of view for each conversation at the end. Jeffrey and I started and also in a way ended with this notion that there is no banal image. The question is not only what we see, but also how we see it and what kind of questions we are asking towards what we see. In the last 20 years, vernacular has become part of the discourse and practice in all fields of the arts and criticism. I asked Jeffrey if money spent on vernacular photography through collecting and auctions and galleries doesn't pose a problem. I thought it was very interesting of him to say that we all have roles. The historian, the gallerist, the publisher, the artist. Perhaps the most um, difficult or you might say ethically challenged role is that of the collector and the degree to which collectors have been shaping the discourse in recent years both because often these collectors are very wealthy and so they have huge resources and because they have their own um, desires invested in their collecting which is often almost obsessional in its acuity of focus i, I would say a history of the role of the collector needs to be written the conversation also made me rethink the role of an historian as not only someone who contextualizes history through evidence, but also someone who has a responsibility to keep the balance. We talked about what an art market does to images and how historians can keep things sort of on the ground. He also gave good advice for those who are interested in vernacular or, for that matter, any kind of history and are actively seeking to find something special. The most important thing is to have an acute eye and to be honest about what you see and how you found it and your own circumstances, your own role in the finding and things like that. This is what I would recommend. Thank you for listening to The Photo World. If you're interested in this genre of photography, have a look at our website, vernacularsocialclub.org. We also have a membership program with publications. Until next time, Lukas Birk says ciao.